Welcome to That Entrepreneur Life, a podcast about entrepreneurship that takes you from idea to launch and beyond. Beyond. Each week, your hosts, Andrew Lees and Clint McPherson, discuss different business topics aimed at adding value to any entrepreneur's journey. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. I'm Andrew Lees, and I'm here with my co-host, Clint McPherson. What's up, brother? How you doing? Not much, man. Just coming off the weekend and just excited to kick another week off and record another episode with you and the special guests. We always have exciting guests on our show every week, and this week's no different. So let's welcome our special guest, Terry Jones, to the show. Hey, great to be here, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, it's, we're really excited to have you on the show. Before we get into our questions, can you just tell us uh, a quick who you are and what you're all about? Sure. Um, well, I, I spent 50 years of my career in travel. Um, I started my career as a travel agent. Um, it was kind of crazy. I got out of college, thought I was going to Vietnam. Uh, I had a low draft number, but got rejected because of my eyes and uh, ended spent a year with two other guys going around the world. Uh, and when I came back, I just thought travel was awesome and I wanted to get into it. And much to my father's chagrin, uh, I became a travel agent. Uh, but six months in, did my first startup in that area. We can talk more about that. And over my career, I've done five startups. Uh, two of the big ones are Travelocity.com and Kayak.com. Uh, I've served on 20 corporate boards. Um, for the last 15 years, I've been a speaker on innovation and disruption and authored two books, one called On Innovation, the other one called Disruption Off. So I've had a bunch of different careers actually uh, in in uh, travel and in tech and now as a writer and a speaker. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it keeps it interesting and um, you get some very noteworthy companies in there and we're, we're really excited to you know dig in a little bit more and hear about your other startups as well. Yeah. So, so Terry, I mean, like, like you just mentioned, right, you've had an impressive career, obviously, including the fa- founding of a 10 figure business and kayak.com. I mean, with that said, with Travelocity and everything else that you've done in your life, I mean, can you take us back to when your entrepreneurial journey actually started and what it is about entrepreneurship specifically that really gets you fired up and keeps you doing what you're doing? Well, you know, uh, I worked for six months in a travel company. Uh, and my boss, who was a uh, uh, Korean American, ran the Russian travel desk. And we were one of only four companies in the U.S. that was allowed to do travel to the Soviet Union. He had to be appointed by the government to do that. And he said, look, I've got a backer. I want to leave here and open the fifth. And will you come with me? So we rented an office and uh, we got ready to go. And, and I said, well, Charles, are you going to go to Russia and do the deal? He said, no, I actually can't go because I'm a naturalized uh, Korean citizen. The Soviets won't let a Korean in. You have to go. So at 21, I had to go to Russia and negotiate this deal. And they said, well, where's Charles? And he apparently used to tell him he was Hawaiian. And I said, he's not actually Hawaiian. He's Korean. And they went, oh, well, you know, so I cooled my heels for a week and a half in Russia and uh, negotiated this deal. And we did a startup. Uh, and it was great. And over five years, we opened five offices. I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. We became the 50th largest travel agency in the U.S. Um, and it, I just thought it was awesome. You know, it was you were always on the edge. You never exactly knew what was going to happen next. Um, it was great when it worked out. Uh, and, you know, that one got me into another one. I got really interested in computing. Uh, we computerized our travel agency that was just happening back then. And I jumped in and went to work for this computer startup that was selling computers to travel agents as both a salesperson and an installer, another startup. Six months in, that company was sold to American Airlines. Uh, so then I had a very different 18-year career inside American Airlines wearing a suit and a tie um, in, in marketing and in IT ending up as chief information officer. Um, so that was real different. Um, that we can go on with the story that led to Travelocity. So I just found, uh, you know, in all the startups I've done, uh, it's exciting. 
you always got a feeling in your pit of your stomach, like, I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> um, it, it's new and different all the time. Uh, and just building the business, working with customers, building a great team. Uh, you know, it's like pinball. If you do well, you get a free game, you get to play again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and you really did. I mean, you did kind of pinball through that. That's, that's quite a, a journey. Um, and I think what's interesting, especially for entrepreneurs, is that the journey is never straightforward. You know, it's never a straight path. And I think that's that's the exciting part about it. So you could find yourself um, in a major startup that gets acquired. Then you're you're working for another inside of another business, you know, and I, I wonder what's what is that like after having so much success with a startup? And then all of a sudden, even though you're still super successful, nothing is taking that away from you. You're still an entrepreneur. But how is it then all of a sudden to just be working with another business like yeah, that. Yeah, that's always difficult. And a lot of uh, people can't make that change and they stay a couple of years and they bail. Um, you know, they cash out, they do their thing because they want to play again. Um, you know, I I was a little different. I really liked to, I was in the division of American Airlines that was selling computers to travel agents. And that became a huge part of the airline. It was actually worth more than American Airlines for a time, the computer division. Um, and they sent me all over the place. I was doing marketing and then they said, well, we want you to run 500 programmers. And I said, I got no idea how to do that. And they said, oh, you'll do fine. And so that was, did that for three years. And then they said, well, go run computer operations. And that's 2000 people on a $300 million budget. And I said, I don't know how to do that. And they said, yeah, it's okay, go do that. And I lost my hair running the computer system. <laughs> I was running a system for 40 airlines. Uh, that was fun. And then they, then I was made CIO. And when I was CIO, we had this little online product on AOL and CompuServe called Easy Saver. And we'd been running it for some years. Travelers could go online and make a booking. But, you know, our big customers were travel agents and they wanted it turned off because they finally woke up and said, you're selling bullets to the enemy here, dude. You know, Cut that off. And luckily, our chairman said, no, give it to Jones. He used to be a travel agent. Maybe we'll hide it over there in IT. Well, first thing I did, it was 1996. I put it on the internet. The internet was just a lying business. And that became Travelocity. So what happened was I said to them after about a year, I'd rather go run that than be CIO. That looks like a lot more fun. Being CIO was a pain. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, it sounded like they had lots of jobs for you, but yeah, so that was, was entrepreneurship. And uh, actually, in my book um, on innovation, um, I talk about what's it like to be an entrepreneur and what's it like to build a company inside another company. It's quite different than a VC backed deal, right? You got all these people who really don't want to help you, <laughs> they don't, you know, they want to go back to their real job. So, you know, we created a separate organization. I moved out of the building. Uh, I got my funding differently than other people. There were a lot of things we had to do to keep that business in a greenhouse and let it bloom inside a big company. And eventually, we took it public for $1.2 billion and spun it out. Um, so that story is one I tell a lot as a speaker because every company wants to have a travelocity today. They want to have their own startup inside, but too often, uh, through no fault of their own, you know, it's an elephant stepping on an ant. They don't even know they killed it. <laughs> right. They right. And they're so focused maybe on their, their core business that they can't, they maybe can't see what the potential really is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're the head of Panera Bread said, said once in a big company, your, your delivery muscle is much stronger than your discovery muscle because yeah. you're working the delivery muscle out every day. Yeah, right. Well, a trainer right. would never let you work out with one arm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that happens in corporations. It's, I got to do the quarter, you know, I got to get it done. And then, you know, it, if you don't take risk, if you don't try something new, if you don't fail, you're never going to be a hundred year old company. You know, you're, you're going to die because the world yeah. is done. That's a good point. I mean, when you when we're starting up businesses, it we're really we're um, 
we're flexing that creative part. We're flexing that, you know, discovery um, part. And we're, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. We're like, sometimes we can be a, a solution in search of a problem, you know, and we're trying to really hone in it. Even if we aren't, you know, even if we're really looking at the problems and trying to solve them, we're still trying to figure out exactly what problems to solve them and get to the point where we can just execute every day and just deliver every day. You know, at some point, especially in the beginning, that seems like the dream, I think, to be to have something that's so, you know, so well oiled that you can just deliver on, but then but then it gets too monotonous, too much of the well, same. In the beginning, you know, the number one reason startups fail is no market fit. You think it's a great idea, nobody else does. Um, and I have a speech that's called the journey of the entrepreneur. And in it, I talk about the 10 reasons startup fail, and I use my own examples of, of my own failures and successes. But, you know, there's no market fit, which goes back to one of your earlier comments. What you start with isn't what you're going to end with, because the market is going to tell you, well, I sort of like that. But if it was more like this, it would really do what I wanted. And if you're just too bullheaded to change, then you're done. And 75% of startups are done. Because it was either a bad idea that can't be fixed or they aren't willing to change it. Yeah, I mean, you got to have to be as an entrepreneur, or as a business owner, you have to be willing to pivot. Right. Mm -hmm. um, especially if if that's the direction it needs to go. But there are so many people out there. They are just so, so dead set on not changing because they think their way is the way no matter but what anybody else says. Boss, exactly. But they're not. The customer right. is the boss. The customer is the only boss. So if somebody says, oh, that's a great idea. We love it. And I said, well, I don't know if it's any good. Let's find out. And today, of course, you can use AI. You can use 3D printers. You can use online surveys. There are a hundred ways you can find out if it's any good and if people care. Now, sometimes it takes a while, you know, to change the world. And, you know, you have to understand the prerequisites. I mean, Elon understood that electric cars without chargers don't work. So they built a charger network. And today, Volkswagen announced they're coming out with their cars and they're going to build 17,000 charging stations. And they partner with BP. Okay, so they get it. And BP is now getting it because they said, well, nobody's going to come for gas. <laughs> we better make some money through electricity. You know, so sometimes there are prerequisites to getting it done. The internet was a prereq for our business. It wasn't big enough on AOL and CompuServe. Um, but we found out that customers really like to do their own travel planning uh, up to a certain level. When it got really complicated, they still wanted help and they still do. I mean, of all things, my daughter is a travel agent. Spent my whole career putting them out of business since she are one, right? And well, what does she do? She's in Beverly Hills. She does high-end trips. You want a $10,000 safari? Call her, right? You want a ticket to Vegas? Do it yourself. Right. And that's true with financial services and so many other businesses. I mean, I can, I trade stocks, but if I do something big, I call my financial advisor, right? Um, so, so, you know, we don't see things totally go away. I mean, physical books are still here, but ebooks are huge. Right. Um, right. I mean, there's always. There's always going to be, I think it's important not to think that place everything that any trace of what it used to be. Um, and I think, yeah, and that, and that's great. There should be, there should be some kind of a balance. There should be, um, you should be able to have those high end trips planned by somebody else, just because there's a lot of people who don't want to do it. But if you're, if you're planning a trip, you know, trip to Florida or something, and you can easily just hop on, book that, and you're you're good to go. So, but most things are just an improvement on something else. I mean, look, you know what a Swiffer mop is, um, but Procter and Gamble brought that out. They it's a diaper on a stick. They make diapers. They make cleaning chemicals. They put a diaper on a stick. It's a billion dollar business. Right? It's just a better mop. You know, it's worth a billion dollars. So it, it's about how can I improve something in someone's life. And, and many entrepreneurs start their business because they ran into some commercial frustration that drove them nuts um, and they wanted to fix it. The question is, are enough people bothered by that, that it's a business or is it a feature? Yeah. So I think that's a great segue into my next question, actually, which is about what are you, 
what you're looking for in a new business for it to be disruptive. So I'm, I'm sure you get pitched all the time because of your success and your skill set. What are you think the key indicators are that a new business and, and its leaders have the chance to significantly disrupt the market? Well, you know, usually you invest in the idea and the team, right? So, I mean, those are the key things. Are these people who can execute? And is the idea significantly interesting uh, to enough people? Um, you know, I see so many decks where people uh, go through their idea they don't really talk much about their team, and then they go to the financials. Well, the financials are baloney anyway. They're just up and to the right, and that's that's not going to happen. You know, the question is, how are you going to get customers to come to this idea? You know, and if you think it's going to be word of mouth, it probably won't be. Um, it's great if it is. You know, I mean, we've never seen an ad for Tesla. <laughs> we didn't see an ad for Airbnb for many years. You know, they're great, but that doesn't happen often. So how are you? bring in customers in and what proof do you have uh, you know do you have revenue do you have people who are coming to try it do you have enough people that it really looks like it's going to happen um how are you improving people's life are you saving them time are you saving them money what are you doing you know that's really interesting and different and so many people will come to me and they have this idea and say well this is the way i travel you know i I go and find a monument I want to visit in New York, and then I find the hotel next to it. I said, great, there are four people who do that. You know, nobody travels that way. And the guy tried to build it. It didn't work. You know, um, although, you know, things are changing. Uh, Ten years ago, there were companies that tried to say, well, I want to build a, a trip planner for people who go on trips together who were just buds, right, and split the payment. And they were too early, you know, but. Lots of lots of people, particularly kids, travel that way today. Um, so sometimes your idea is too early. I just worked with somebody who's bringing that out now. It's probably going to work now. It didn't work then, right? Um, I I thought, yeah, I, I built. I spent a million bucks building a product on Travelocity was a total failure. Which was in those days, you'd see prices in newspapers and on TV. Hawaii, one hundred and fifty bucks. But when you call the airline and ask for that fare, they can never find it because they'd all say, well, what day do you want to go? Oh, it's not offered on that day. Well, what about this day? No, it's not offered on that. Well, what day is it offered? We don't know because their system couldn't answer that question uh, because it was built in times when everybody charged the same price. So I turned that all around and I built a calendar to show what day can I get the lowest fare. New York Times thought it was awesome. You know, it was on CNN. All stuff. Nobody used it. It was too early in the Internet. People were still figuring out where the gas pedal was. They were still figuring out how to shop. And I was showing, you know, star drives to a caveman. Um, and it didn't didn't work. Now everybody has it. Sure. Now, now so it makes the most sense, to, right? You have to look at, you know, where where is it in the world that this is going to work? And are my customers ready for that? Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you look at Clubhouse, you know, which has just come out. <clears throat> And millions of people are flocking to it. I don't know quite how it's going to get monetized yet. Probably doesn't matter if they get enough people to find a way. But, you know, Clubhouse is coming behind the whole world we're in right now, podcasts. And, yep. you know, so it's an audio extension that might not have worked before everybody did podcasts. And so, uh, yeah, I don't think it would have. I, I think it's really interesting. I think it, it's cool. I'm, I'm on it. Um, and Clint and I are going to get more active on it because it, it is perfect for podcasts. If you have a podcast, um, it's a great way to connect with your, your audience, you know, like, Hey, let's, let's jump in a room. Clint and I can jump in a room and we can actually interact with the people who are listening to the show and figure out what is it that they want to learn more of, you know? So, um, what, who, who do they want to hear from? What do they want to talk about? You know, and just kind of get a, a more interactive feel. So it's a great extension of that. But yeah, I think just if maybe even five years ago, if we had heard this just audio platform, it would have been. It would have worked. And timing is so important. I mean, you look at 3D printing, you know, which is, which has been around a long time, but now we've got 3D printing with metal and we're adding AI to it. And, People are making parts 
And you still say, well, you know, is it really cheaper? And it takes a long time to build things with a 3D printer. And then people point out, well, it only has to be faster than the ship from China, right? So um, now I don't need the people. Now I can insource it back here. Uh, my robot is cheaper than the guy I outsource to across the world. And I don't want a long supply chain now because I'm worried about pandemics. Boom, 3D printers are here. You know, it's a, it's a perfect time for that. And, and the pandemic has been so interesting because, you know, the pandemic is like a war and in a war it's do or die. So people take risks that they don't normally take. As a speaker on disruption, technological disruption, usually I have to convince people it's time to change. The disruption is coming. They don't believe it. You know, they, they don't believe they're on a burning platform until the platform burns up. Well, now they all believe it, right? Now the question is, okay, I'm in a burning platform. What, what do I do? Um, so my book, Disruption Off, is about 10 new technologies coming for your business. That's the first half. That's to scare the crap out of people. The second half is, what do I do? <laughs> you know, how, do I, how do I deal with these new technologies? And you know, in a big corporation, they have to deal with them. In a startup, it's how do I use them as my offensive weapon to go disrupt the market? For sure. I mean, I really think you have to have the pivot mindset at all times, especially with stuff today, right? Technology advances so fast. Things change so fast. Pandemics are hitting now that, you know, we're just changing business as a whole and how people do things. You know, I have I own a digital marketing agency and I do a lot of marketing and I was doing a lot of marketing for restaurants. Right. And then a lot of restaurants mm -hmm. were like, Time out, right? Like we have to figure out a new way because there are a lot of local restaurants, not big chains or anything. And so they really got hit in the face and a lot of them didn't want to do the DoorDash, the Uber Eats and all this stuff. But then right. it came to the point where like they have to do that or offer something in lieu of it to just survive. Just hang around. Right. And maybe they're going to end up as a ghost kitchen. A friend of mine in Maryland called his grocery store you know, because he was locked down. And he wanted to say, well, I said, well, can I pick up the groceries? You know, do you have a pickup service? They said, no, we'll send a drone. And they sent a drone out to his house about the size of a kid's wagon. Now, that was illegal before COVID. But the local city said, well, let's just try this. And, you know, this drone showed up and his dog went nuts and he got his groceries. And, you know, so things that weren't allowed before. Look, in Florida, CVS is doing drone delivery of drugs into retirement communities because they don't want a person coming in there. You know, again, prohibited before, now allowed. Um, I, I actually met with an interesting drone company that started in Africa delivering blood by a drone because very hard to get around, the roads weren't very good. And why did they start in Africa? I said, there are no drone rules in Africa. Now he's been asked back into the US because they've seen what it does and they said, well, let's change the rule. So that's pretty innovative to look at a place. I mean, one of the biggest drone uh, experimentation areas in, in the country is Nevada, where I live. And that's because there's nothing to hit in Nevada. We're a desert. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so we have Area 51, right? Um, <clears throat> so you need to look at where can I go? Regulations change rapidly uh, when there's a crisis because government always shows up late. So car dealers were fighting Tesla and saying, shouldn't be allowed to sell online. And car dealers have a lot of clout. So in 18 states, they weren't allowed to sell online. Now all the car dealers are saying, wait, wait, we want to sell online too. Change the rules. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you got to look for the, God, what's happening right now? And as an entrepreneur, how can I go capitalize on that change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you can predict what might happen, hey, if if something, not that anybody is trying to predict the pandemic, I mean, well, th there were people who were trying to predict the pandemic, but, um, you know, and it, it's not like we want that kind of thing to happen. Um, but the interesting outcome, the interesting byproduct of, of it is all this acceleration, you know, e-commerce. Oh, yeah. Accelerating. E people who think yeah. about the future are futurists. People who predict the future are billionaires, right? Because <laughs> they, they sure. predicted it correctly. Um, yep. And you're right. E-commerce is up 50 percent. Instacart hired 350,000 people. Amazon hired something like a half a million. So did Walmart um, because it changed overnight. And, and Best Buy, for example, had an 18 month plan to get the curbside delivery. 
It's all in a big book. They did it in two <laughs> days. <laughs> and the boss won't forget that, right? Yeah. So that's what we do in a startup is that we would have started out doing it in two days. Yeah, we figure out what we can do if we just, you know, sort of fills. Not sure what that um, what that theory is where you'll use as much time as you have to get something done. Oh, yeah. And if you don't have any time to get it done, you'll get it done. The you figure out exactly how quickly you can get it done. Yeah, there's a coding book called The Mythical Man Month. It's about that, and, you know, yeah. just the man months expand. It's like building the F-35, you know, it takes 10 years because they have 10 years and they can get paid for 10 years and sure. startups can't, you know, most startups run out of money. So if you look at things like 3D printing and AI and drones and IOT and robotics, you know, that's where the action is um, it, that's going to scale massively. Uh, yeah. to build big businesses. 100%. So, so Terry, we love your action-oriented approach with audiences, right? And that's what we're trying to do with our podcast um, and to go beyond the inspirational and help our audience with strategy that they can apply in their business today. And then, so that's where we're trying to take our podcast and that's why we bring guests on and, and have conversations like this. So what's one thing that entrepreneurs can implement right away that can quickly separate them from their competition? Well, I, again, I think, you know, usually they have a good idea or hopefully one. Um, they got a little bit of funding. And the real next question that, that people overlook so much, and maybe you can help them in your digital marketing agency, is how do I scale this thing from a customer perspective? How do I get enough people to know about it that I can gain revenue? And, you know, if it's B2C, obviously, you know, they call you and they, they look into digital marketing and they're doing social marketing. Um, th that's the overlooked piece. And, and how do you do that in a, in a way that breaks through? I mean, you look at, Dollar Shave Club, you know, grew into a billion dollar organization by doing crazy YouTube ads, right? Mm -hmm. Who would have thought you'd subscribe to a razor? Now, the three of us apparently don't subscribe to razors. But, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, there are people touche. who do. Um, so what is the new strategy? I mean, hell, we built Travelocity with, you know, we had ads in newspapers and on radio and TV. Well, by the time we got to Kayak, 10 years later, it was all search. Um, now, you know, you're moving on, you're going to be on Clubhouse somehow. So how do I bring the people, enough people in the door? And if it's B2B, you know, it's it's going to be an interesting combination. B2B has also moved massively to e-commerce recently. So mm -hmm. how do I get in the door in e-commerce with those guys? Because I don't need a salesman to be out there quoting prices and talking about speeds and feeds. That's all online. I need yep. somebody to build a relationship and to solve the company's problem you know, using my product, which might mean, you know, a, a startup needs to buy a 50 year old bag carrier who knows everybody in the industry who can get their name around. Um, because, you know, I had guys in my last company and it didn't work. Company failed. It was an AI company. But my sales guys were all your age. And they'd say, well, I wrote this contact three emails and he didn't answer. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. I said, you have a telephone? You know, uh, do you have an airplane? Can you call yeah. him? You'll see him. You Can you see take him, him yeah. out to lunch? Can you do something different? People don't yeah. answer email, you know, necessarily. Yeah. Particularly in B2B, but, you know, he was, wasn't used to that. So um, it, it depends on your market. Obviously, government sales, totally different. That's why the drone guys said, we'll go to Africa and make our name. And then the, the governments will see us and they'll mm -hmm. want what we do. Um, I, I think it's the hardest thing is is either you know you can be lucky and yeah. build a product that's so friggin' awesome that everybody in the world wants it and you never have to advertise so you're a facebook or airbnb you know or tesla um mm -hmm. and or you know, it probably ain't happening so then what is your innovative way um at, at travelocity we did all kinds of crazy pr things because we didn't have any advertising we couldn't get the airline to give us any. Mm -hmm. so uh, I built, for example, I built a TV studio in Travelocity way before Zoom and all this stuff. And we had the first travel database in the country because travel agents were small. We knew where everybody was going. We knew more than the airlines did. So we would put out statistics. It's spring. Here's where the low fares are. Here's where everybody's going. Well, guess what? Oh, well. 
everybody wanted us on the air. So I was getting on TV doing gigs. When 9-11 happened, after 9-11, we, TSA locked everything down, right? It wasn't even a TSA. We figured, I figured, people going home for Thanksgiving won't know how long the lines are going to be. They'll have no idea because the lines mm. are hours long. Oh, so yeah. I put people in 22 airports with stopwatches, timing the lines. We put that data on the homepage of Travelocity and showed people where it was. Well, all the news outlets picked that up. And pretty soon I was on CNN every hour giving the update. Wow. Well, yeah. awesome publicity for us. What did it cost sure. us? Nothing. You know, hardly yeah. anything. You have those people out there. And everybody said, oh, Travelocity is the place where you can get cool stuff. So, you know, it was just a stunt, but it worked. And, you know, a lot of sometimes you have to do that. If you have a new and different product, uh, you can, because, you know, today, you not only have 24 hour cable news, which is dying for content. Sure. You have a podcasts too. Right. <laughs> right. And, and blogs and, and, and blogs and videos. And yeah. And social networks, are, you know. And, and so, how you tell your story and make it exciting. Is, is super important. I mean, there's thousands of other things about building the right team and keeping it creative and, and getting people, don't hire your best friend, hire the best person. I mean, we go on and on about all the other things startups need to do. But yeah. I think figuring out how to, you know, bring the meat to the door mm-hmm. <laughs> is real important. I, I agree. I think it it's interestingly often overlooked and underestimated yeah. and it, it, it is, I mean, Clint and I both know for our, our businesses, it, it is the most important thing. Um, and when you're trying to get business on a daily basis and trying to figure out how to grow your business, it, um, it becomes something that you really obsess and focus on a lot. And I, I love that you, um, that you talked about what you did at Travelocity to bring, you know, to, to get some attention and get some free press because, at the end of the day, that's, that's helpful content. And that's, you know, what a lot of people are doing. If you have a blog, you're trying to write helpful content, right? That is relevant to your industry, to your product, your service or whatever. You're trying to bring people to your website and say, Hey, look at all this helpful stuff I have. It's all free, but if you want to go deeper, here's what, you know, here's what we have, or we have this product that's, you know, in line with what you're already looking for. Well, absolutely. So and sometimes you get lucky, you know, at, at, at kayak, we had this new idea that was vertical search for travel. So we weren't a travel agent. We just consolidated all the prices. And if you click, you bought direct. Um, and you could, you could buy from the airline, you could buy from another travel agent, didn't matter. But we also focused, and this was our CTO, on making the fastest product on the web. I mean, Kayak was just super, super spare and really, really fast. When we went to mobile, he built a team and they thought, well, mobile's gonna be about next flight out because the meeting ran short or a hotel for tonight because the meeting ran over. It turned out we were dead wrong, but we had this concept. They had the concept, I was a chairman that all the emails we got, customer emails, went to the engineers. So, you know, you might think that's crazy because engineers are expensive, but our slogan was give the pain to the people who cause the pain, right? (laughs) And the engineers said, hey, everybody's really not doing that. They're using mobile just like the desktop. Well, this was early days of mobile. We didn't know that. And, you know, we, we thought mobile was a mobile thing, not a desktop replacement. Turns out, so they flipped on their head and made it a desktop replacement. They had over 50 million users now. Um, if they hadn't had short feedback loops, if they hadn't listened to what the customer was saying, you know, and just said, well, if this is the way it is, it would have died. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked. So, you know, part of as you get the people in the door, um, they have to listen. There's a guy in New York called the Amazon Whisperer, and he's one of those. Uh, Third Avenue electronic store kind of guys, you know, just has all the chunky electronics in there. And what he does is goes out on Amazon and reads all the bad reviews around the product and then goes and make the product that doesn't have those. So he's taken all the user feedback from somebody's shower radio and saying, well, it's really great, but the knobs, you know, I can't, when I'm soapy, I can't turn the knob or 
whatever it is, falls off the shower, whatever it is, and says, hey, I have one out there. What does he advertise? Has these features. And suddenly the people, you know, bought a crappy one, buy a good one, and then they tell everybody. And, that's, and, that's, I mean, that's genius to just, because you can genius. focus on, yeah, you can really focus on that. I tell my clients when they're launching a product, if you want to do really great market research, that's at the top of the list is look at reviews and Amazon right. reviews are eat. People will absolutely dump on a product if it is, you know, if it is oh, not right. what, yeah. it, and they're much more, I think, uh, candid and happy to do that on Amazon than any other platform I've seen. You know, mm -hmm. they're not necessarily going to write a terrible review on your, you know, your Shopify store as much as the no problem on Amazon. So yeah, they just do it. And you, you yeah. have to listen to that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, very it important. Really, you know, people tell me when I speak to like groups of small entrepreneurs or, or small businesses, traditional businesses, they said, well, I don't want to have reviews on my site. I might get a bad one. And I say, look, you sucked before. You just didn't know it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> listen, it's a chance to improve. You want sure. people to tell you that. I mean, one yeah. of the things we did in my last company is we happened to get a hold of many tens of thousands of reviews from a big travel site. They let us do this. And we used AI to analyze all of them. And then we were able, when the customer said, I want, uh, you know, an Airbnb-like property in downtown Austin that has a great backyard. Well, when they showed up with their search, because they're using natural language, right, to search instead of. Austin, June 6th, they were actually saying what they wanted. What did they get? The first picture wasn't the front of the place. It was the backyard. And all the reviews were about great backyard. So I didn't have to read 10,000 reviews. I just got the ones that were about backyard or golf or whatever it was. People aren't, you still don't do that. You know, the Amazon, they have that secondary search where you can search reviews for, you know, does it have an external antenna or does it work underwater or whatever. But, you know, why not let me just ask that? and show me a picture of it working underwater. Um, you know, you, you have to understand customer intent because you don't always know what are they gonna do with the product. Um, I, I had a guy recently who wanted, to, he was starting a tool rental business, I mean, the kayak for tool rental, right? So you wanna rent a post hole digger, or you wanna rent a drill or whatever. And he said, well, part of the problem is, you know, I, I compete with Home Depot, um, and they kind of do that cheap. And I said, yeah, because, but they don't, what none of them do is to, when you go to Home Depot and say, I want to rent a post hole digger, you have one. It doesn't say, why do you want it? Why are you digging a hole? Well, it should say, I'm digging a hole to put it in the fence. Oh, we have a sale on fence posts. You know, if you buy the fence posts, I'll give you the digger. <laughs> you need to understand customer intent because then you can sell them a lot more stuff. For sure. <laughs> I love that because, I mean, it's very important, even you posting somebody up and, and timing um, to get that on and then to get that additional exposure and, and that individual going on and selling to Amazon pro or, or improving on Amazon products that have flaws. I mean, that's thinking outside the box. Right. And as entrepreneurs, that's super important. Not only be able to will not only being ready and willing to pivot, but also thinking outside the box. And I think sometimes we we get so focused on what we're doing that we can paint ourselves in a predetermined box and think this is where we have to stay. But I love that message and, and, I'm, and I love we're hitting on it to where it's like, look, you have to think outside the box, right? You have to well, continuously listen, look, at, do look that. at how people are thinking outside the box with traditional products. So it could be your business model. Subscribe to a razor. I mean, he just bought the razors from somebody. He didn't make razors. He bought them in China. He just said, I'll send you a razor every week or every couple of weeks. Um, Philips, the lighting company, just went to Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam and said, we don't want to sell you light bulbs anymore. I said, really? I said, no, we want to sell you light. We want to light the airport for the next 20 years. So they got an outcome-based contract. So what did they do? They got the contract. They put in bulbs that lasted longer. They put in bulbs that use less power because they're paying for the power. They are recycling them in the circular economy when they're old. And they have a 20-year contract. It's way more profitable than selling bulbs, right? And a lot of people are looking at subscriptions. They're looking at outcomes. They're saying, can I build a platform for my industry? In, in farming, companies like Deere 
are snapping up these satellite companies who look at your field to analyze crop yield. Because what they want to do is tie that in with, with the tractor and the planter and the harvester into an ecosystem where the farmer's all tied up and they're making, they're helping the farmer make more money. So the outcome is you get more corn, right? Now, eventually, maybe they'll just say, look, we want to take a piece of the upside. We'll give you the tractor because <laughs> we're a partner in your farm. Or maybe they won't, but they are a partner in the farm because they're helping the farmer it not just save money with a new tractor that goes faster, but growing more corn at the same time. Mm. Yeah. So the, instead of being in the business of selling tractors, they could look at it as they're in the business of helping somebody grow corn or somebody grow right. something or, or whatever it is and really, and really act more like a partner than just, Hey, we'll sell you this thing. We don't care what you do with but it, it. But it's a different kind of a sale. If you move from selling a product to selling a service, it's a very different kind of sale. So I worked with Honeywell a couple of years ago. Honeywell sold sensors for 120 years, like a thermostat, it's just a sensor. Well, they said, hey, we want to move up from sensing to meeting. So instead of the red light going on, we want a display that says compressor off section four, turn on the backup air conditioner. Right. And then they wanted to move from meaning to action. So now, instead of the red light going on, display comes up, says the compressor went down, section four, we turned off the backup, and the repairman is coming. That's an outcome. They can guarantee uptime. It's worth a whole lot more money than, than trying to convince the purchasing manager that you can save them three cents on the sensor. Right. It embeds you in the company. Um, they'll never kick you out. It's too hard. Right, because you're their process. So a lot of people are looking at outcomes and, and process-based solutions. It's tougher say. Um, but you know, the, the fact that we're combining sensors with AI and sophisticated software into solutions for people, you know, that's a, a great entrepreneurial story uh, that people look at all the time and say, how how can I how can I do that? Yeah. I love that. So Terry, through your entrepreneurial journey from the highs to the lows, what do you think the most difficult thing about being an entrepreneur is for you? Well, I think, um, you know, the creation of the team is so critical um, when you're starting out and getting the right people and spending enough time. Our CTO at Kayak would go anywhere in the world to hire an A plus engineer because A engineers are exponentially better than B engineers. And he would always, his last question was always, who's the smartest person that you know? I want to go hire him or her. Um, so you don't want to hire your best friend unless your best friend is absolutely the best person. Um, Cause maybe you get along with them, but you don't necessarily want to get along with everybody. William Wrigley, the chewing gum guy said, if two people in business always agree, one of them is irrelevant. I don't, I want somebody who says, no, nah, hey, well, well, that might not work. Now, in the end, you get to make the decision. But, you know, putting together a, a great team uh, makes a huge amount of difference. And VCs look at that. You know, who, who's on the team? Have they done this kind of thing before? Has your CFO been through, you know, going public? Um, have you been on to or have you failed before? What, what did you write? What did you do wrong? Um, Who's, you know, how'd you get the world's greatest marketing person? We really spend time building that team. Obviously, you know, your idea is critical and, uh, but you probably already have that. You know, you've got your idea. Now you've got to get, get it shared with a bunch of people who can turn it into a product. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And there, your team is who's going to help you execute on, on the vision. So you, you have to, you have to get the best at what they do and not be afraid to get people who are smarter than you. And you may have to change them all the time because because mm. starters may not be runners, you know, or, or they may not be growers. Mm. They can start, yeah. but they can't grow. Um, you know, you get to a certain point. I had a, a person running product and I should have changed out earlier to drive velocity because they, they, they couldn't grow. They were great with four engineers. They weren't great with 400. Um, and it's hard, you know, you get to be friends and you have to say, hey, you know, you, you need to do something else. Um, and that happens to entrepreneurs. You know, sometimes you may have to fire yourself. 
because you realize, you know, I, I can't grow it this big. I'm going to keep my stake, but let's get somebody in here to help me uh, who can. Yeah, no, I love that. I, th- I think as entrepreneurs, too, even even like small business, right? Like coming in, starting your own business and, and not even thinking about a team. Like for me, when I started my digital marketing agency, I was learning. I started it. I was one person. But you, you have to realize that as an entrepreneur, you have to surround yourself with a team at some point to be able to scale, right? Because you're only one person and you can only put so many hours in a day. And then it gets to the point where it just becomes you start doing things that you don't really enjoy, right? But because they're necessary, you have to do them. So when you branch off and you get a VA or a virtual assistant or surround yourself with a physical team that you can pass those those tasks off that you might not be an expert in that you know how to do, but you don't get no enjoyment out of. So I really think right. it's important it's, to identify it, it, that. You may not, you know, the hardest thing in, in business of becoming a manager is you can always do everything better than everybody else. Can't you? Sure. You always think that. That's <laughs> in your head, yeah. Yeah. So get, you know, maybe the person you hire isn't as good as you, but at least they get it done and you can help them and train them. And, and today you, you said the word VA, you know, my, my son, he sold his first video game at, at the age of 18. Uh, and then he finished college and he went to work for Sony and then electronic arts. So he's in the world's biggest game company and he quit. And with four guys, they went off to build a video game. So how do four guys compete with a company the size of EA who spends 200 million on a game? Well, they outsource everything, right? <laughs> And they were the core guys who designed and coded the game, but they outsourced their music, they outsourced their advertising, they outsourced parts of it. You can do that today. Travelocity went public with 3,000 people. Kayak went public with 200. You know, now it's 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 a guy and a gal and a dog and a credit card, right? I mean, it's just on how you build it. So um, it, you can really outsource those things you don't know how to do, and you should. Because big companies are trying very hard. I work with big groups of CIOs who are saying, you know, they used to have their own payroll system and their own inventory system, their own manufacturing system. All that stuff is gone. It's all in the cloud. He said, what are the key things that differentiate us? That's all we're spending money on, you know. Um, and, and that's what you got to do. So, you know, I'd encourage people, go go to Amazon, take a look at the book on innovation, it's an unusual book. It's it's 72 three-page chapters. It's a cookbook. Um, you can read it front to back or back to front or read Disruption Off. Same thing. Um, it's all about all the new technologies and how they're being deployed. And, you know, maybe it's talking a story that's not your industry. That's good because then you can figure out how to do it for your industry. How am I going to put drones in, you know, the pipeline industry or the farming industry? Um and they're available in paperback or Kindle or in uh, audiobooks. Um, and, it, you know, because it, you, you really want to pick up all the lessons you can. And that's what this podcast is about uh, from, from entrepreneurs. You should just be making new mistakes. Don't make yeah. the mistakes that other people, you don't have to make the mistakes that I made. Yeah. You can read about them. Exactly. The yeah. So definitely check out those books, everyone, because that's, uh, that is a, a great, point is why make your, why make the mistakes that somebody else has learned from them. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of awesome yeah, there they are. info in there. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can see in there. That's awesome. So, so Terry, I mean, we, we would love to talk to you all day. Um, and, and it, we've had a blast talking to you and having you on the show, but as we wrap up this episode, my man, if you could leave our listeners with one piece of advice, and you're talking to entrepreneurs here or aspiring entrepreneurs, what would it be? Well, I, I think it's about being okay with failure. Um, and we've talked about that in many ways. You know, the biggest problem in big corporations is they stop taking risk um, and they, they're afraid to fail. Entrepreneurs fail a lot, but sometimes, you know, you're going to fail along the way in a lot of little ways. Um, suck it up. You know, turn that. Why do sports teams watch game films? Not to assess blame for the fumble. It's to figure out how not to fumble again. How do we win the next game? Um, You know, they look at sports teams, look at all the stats to figure out, well, this person needs to improve here, you know, or there. 
So, you know, an error is a failure in baseball, but right. you're going to work on, well, you know, you're, you don't do very good in this kind of play or you, your slider is lousy or whatever it is. Um, learn from those mistakes quickly. Um, you know, we learned at kayak, Hey, we're not doing the right thing with mobile. We got to change it. Um, 20% of kayak every day is, is a test. We are constantly testing, generally failing, but continuously learning. So, you know, AB test your whole business, not just your ads. <laughs> constantly AB testing. Oh, we did, you know, we screwed up on accounting. Well, was it the person's fault? And, and kill projects, not people. You know, because if you fire the person who fails, nobody else is going to take a risk again. So, yeah, if the person fails over and over again, you know, as, as Yogi Berra said, I think in the ninth inning, he put in three, sec, three second basemen. He said, second base is so screwed up, nobody can play it. Right? <laughs> it was second base's fault. Um, you know, sometimes it's just it's not the person's fault. It's the project wasn't a good idea. OK, thanks, Sally. What are you going to do next? Uh, but if Sally gets demoted, Bob ain't ever going to try. Right. Just, and head down. And usually you learn something. I mean, you're almost always learning sure. something in those failures that can then take you through the successes. So, yeah. I mean, it's really I mean, important I to have I was those. too early with that program that put prices on a calendar. I, I learned not to get too far ahead of the customer again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a CFO once I at American, I blew a million dollars on, a, on an early project and I was terrified to go see him. And he said, what did you learn? Mm. Um, that's what he wanted to know. And that word spread like wildfire. A million wasn't much to him. He was in a multi-billion dollar company. It was a lot to me. I knew I couldn't yeah. lose a million bucks again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, he said, what did you learn? And, and everybody heard that, that I didn't get fired. Um, that means you're going to stand up and take another risk. Again, look at Sure. A baseball player is awesome if he fails 70% of the time at the point. Right? Yeah. Well, it gets amazing. a lot of chances. Now, you don't get that many chances as an entrepreneur. If you continually fail, you're just going to go out of business. But some of those failures are okay as long as you, as long as you move fast. I agree. Perfect. Well, guys, I mean, I think that's a wrap for this episode, Terry. From the both of us, we want to thank you for taking the time out of your day and joining us and adding value what we're doing on our podcast. Well, my pleasure. You know, I'm, I'm still a speaker and a virtual one. So if you're looking for a great speaker on this topic, anybody out there in podcast land, uh, you can find me at tbjones.com. And there are tons of videos there, tbjones.com, lots of videos. You can watch my speeches. You can find a book. Uh, and maybe I can come make a speech for you guys. Love Thanks. it. That's awesome. Right. So cool. Yeah, let's definitely stay in touch. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, um, thank you all so much for listening to That Entrepreneur Life. To learn more about what Terry is working on, like he said, check out tbjones.com. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to our podcast. And don't forget to download our free ebook about the success mindset at thatentrepreneurlife.com. And if you're interested in having us do some mini masterclass episodes this year at some point, please contact us through our website and let us know. Thanks for continuing to support what we do as entrepreneurs. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode of That Entrepreneur Life. Thanks for listening to That Entrepreneur Life podcast. Be sure to visit thatentrepreneurlife.com to join the conversation, access our show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode as we continue to add value. Until next time.